Father God, I need more. Our church needs more. My family needs more. I want more. I want more hope, more joy, more peace, more love. I want the fullness of life that Jesus offers. Father, saturate my soul with your spirit so that I overflow with Jesus. I want more. But I confess I'm full of everything but Jesus. I've loaded my mind with so much noise that it's weary and worried. I've heaped stuff upon my soul that's left little space for the spirit who truly satisfies. I filled my time with my own agenda. I'm full, but it's not you. Something has to go. I'm bringing you everything, not you, that fills me up. I open my hands in a posture of surrender. Empty me. The noise, the distractions, the clutter, the fears, my attempts to control, my bitterness, my wounds. The burdens I've tried to carry on my own. My attempts to control, my stuff, even me. Empty me of me. With open hands, I surrender everything, not you. Empty me so you can fill me with joy and peace that overflows in hope. Empty me so you can saturate my soul with your spirit. Empty me so I can abound with the life coming from your hand. Fill us so full that we can't help but overflow with Jesus. Fill our families with your presence. Fill our neighborhoods with your love. Fill our valleys with the knowledge of your glory. Fill us so full that we can't help but overflow with Jesus. Amen. Hey, welcome to Calvary. Wherever you find yourself and however you found us, you are so welcome. We're in the midst of a 50-day journey of lust for more, looking at some emptying practices that make space in our lives for God. And today it's the practice of forgiveness, giving grace. And, and you know what? Forgiving empties us of so much junk. Stephen Mansfield tells one of my favorite forgiveness stories. It starts with a church that had this incredible ministry to men. For years, the driving force behind the men's ministry was a guy named Taylor. I mean, he had really impacted the community and changed a bunch of guys' lives. But, but in the midst of a major transition in the church, Taylor got deeply offended and he left the church, wouldn't talk to anybody. People figured that sooner or later he'd come back, but, but he, he didn't. Finally, some guys decided to go after Taylor. They got together, they came up with this plan. They set up camp in Taylor's yard. 150 guys at times, a little Taylorville. They, they set up rotating shifts, had electric lines running from neighboring houses to power TVs. About 20 smokers and grills worked up some amazing barbecue. They had big signs all over the place. Taylor, come out, we love you. Taylor was not amused. He even called the police. In fact, the police showed up twice a day for almost a week. And every time they came, Taylor would come to the door to talk to the police. And every time Taylor came to the door, the guys camping in his yard would just explode with cheers. On the sixth day, when Taylor opened the door for the police, the, the men exploded again with cheers. But this time, Taylor broke down and just started crying his eyes out. He came to the guys. He sputtered out how sorry he was, and he, he, he greeted the guys who camped out in his yard and, and refused to go away without their friendship restored. Let me ask you, have you ever pursued grace like that? Can, can I tell you what was actually happening in, in that yard? They were having church. They experienced the presence of Jesus. This group of men emptied out the offense, emptied out the pain and the hurt and the bitterness and the anger, and they were making space for Jesus together, together. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. He says to his disciples, his followers, again I say to you, if two or three of you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. If just two or three, Jesus says, with a oneness of heart, gather in my name, I'll show up. But for two or three to come together and make space for Jesus, man, we need to get good at the emptying practice of forgiveness. Now, if you understand the context of Matthew chapter 18, Matthew 18 really starts back in Matthew 16, where Jesus is talking to his disciples about church. Only a couple times where he talks about church. And here, here's what he says. He says, I will build my church. And when I build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
Uh, Then in Matthew 16, verses 21 through 25, Matthew writes, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now, to hear what Jesus is saying, he's basically saying, I love the church so much that I will die for her. And of course, Jesus died for you and me. He died for individuals, but he also died for his church. He died to redeem the mess of the church and make her beautiful. But then he rose again. And now do you know where you can find him? You can find him everywhere, anytime we gather in community. I mean, even just two or three of us. We get together, and where we are, there he is. And, and his presence his, his presence comes, and nothing matters more to the life of the church than the presence of Jesus. You know, there's so many things that we do that we call church, but the bottom line is that if Jesus isn't present, it's not church. And if Jesus is present, it's church anywhere, anytime, any place. When it comes to emptying practices like silence and solitude and surrender and simplicity, Jesus, remember we said this very beginning, Jesus is the why of our what, right? We're we're emptying stuff, but not just to empty stuff, we're emptying stuff to make space for God in our lives. We we wanna be filled with the Spirit of God, we wanna be filled with Jesus. And, And most of the emptying practices that we looked at are things that you can practice on your own. Disciplines that will help you as an individual make more space for God in your life. And forgiveness is that as well. But forgiveness is also an emptying practice that makes space for God in us, in our life together. So that making space for God is not just an individual endeavor. Sometimes a corporate, a corporate emptying is necessary because sometimes we discover the why of our what together, together. See, the gospel's greatest gift is found together. That, that word agree, when Jesus says, if two or three of you will agree on anything, I'll do it, the word agree is the word symphonio. Think symphony. It's, it's deeper than just mere verbal agreement. It, that there's a diversity, but a unity of heart. It's a heart issue. It's one heart. Are we together in heart? And, and see, when, when hearts agree, there's this beautiful music that, that draws in the heart of God and opens up the gates of heaven so that What's up there can come down here. But let's be honest. Sometimes community hurts. Sometimes being together is hard. It's easier to be divided and offended and angry and dismissive and judgmental. It's easier to walk away. And we've done way too much of that in the last three years. Sometimes Community hurts and and relationships are difficult. Sometimes we get hurt and sometimes we hurt others. So listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. He says this, You've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say to you, I say to you, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, (laughs) You're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Now, now you realize this is kind of a description of things people do and feel after they've been hurt, wronged, or offended. For example, the word that Jesus used for anger was orgitsmo. It it describes a slow kind of meditative anger, the kind that we nurse to keep alive. A seething grudge. Sour bitterness. When it fills our hearts, it kills community. I mean, can, can you relate to that? Have you ever experienced that? Like, like just filled with bitterness. I've sat with people who could recite long records of hurts and offenses that happened decades ago, and as they recite it, it feels like it must have just happened yesterday. Filled with hurt. Filled with pride. It's, it's not my problem. It's her fault. His, his problem filled with anger and hurt. And and when we get filled with that kind of junk, what what do we do? (laughs) We kill them. (laughs) You say, no, no, wait a minute, Dan. I I agree with Jesus. Murder is bad, but I've never done that. I'm I'm not that guy. I'm not not that that person who kills people. Okay, Jesus says, you've you've never murdered, but what about anger? Have you ever been angry with someone? Well, yeah, but (laughs) same thing, Jesus says. 
what? Or anger and murder? Those are obviously not the same. But, but remember, God is looking at the heart. We focus on the external, but Jesus is seeking a space to occupy that's made up from a quality of hearts coming together. Have you ever been angry? That, that kind of anger that comes when somebody blocks your goal or nobody listens to you or something was said about you that you think is so unfair. Nope, not me. I don't get angry. Okay. Not sure I believe you, but how about this one? Have you ever called someone an idiot? <laughs> oh, oh man, that, that's my word of choice when I'm driving. There's so many idiots on the road when I'm driving. But it's not just on the road. Did you ever run across any idiots on social media? All kinds of idiots calling other people idiots. Or, or what about cursing someone? In the NIV, it says anyone who calls someone a fool is in danger of hellfire. <laughs> Now, the Greek word here for fool is moros, from which we get the word moron. But, but moros didn't just mean stupid. A fool was someone who didn't care about God. To call someone a fool was to attack their spiritual integrity. Have you ever done that? Oh, my goodness. And, and, and for Jesus, it was kind of like saying, you're going to hell. That'll kill a relationship. See, let, let, let this soak in a little bit. See, here's what Jesus is asking us. Maybe you've never murdered a person, but have you ever killed a relationship? Have you ever criticized someone? Not out of love, but out of anger. Not to help them, but to satisfy your need for justice. Have you ever, have you ever written someone off, given up on a relationship, refused to forgive, refused to ask for forgiveness? Have you ever killed community? You know what Jesus is doing in Matthew 5 through 7? We call it the Sermon on the Mount. What, what he's really doing, at least in this section, is he's diving deep into our sin. And honestly, we don't love the concept of sin today. I mean, sin involves moral absolutes and judgment. We, we prefer words like mistake. A, a mistake is an error in action or calculation. I'm not bad. I just didn't have all the info. I tried, but I'm not perfect. It's an oops, not a sin. My, my goodness, it's a, a snafu, a blunder, a blooper of your French. It's a faux pas, but it's not sin. It's just an oops. But what Jesus is doing in Matthew 5 through 7, he's trying to help us to see that we're not oopsters. We're, we're actually sinners. I'm not just an oopster. Neither are you. In fact, I've, I've killed a relationship or two. So have you. <laughs> I, 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 we've all had moments where we decided that protecting ourselves was more important than telling the truth. I, I've, I've had moments where I soaked in anger, convincing myself trying to convince myself that it was righteous anger, but in reality, I was just offended by what someone thought of me, unfairly, I thought, and, and so I stewed in the offense and I nursed my anger and cultivated my bitterness. So here's what I'm not doing. I'm not asking you to just try harder to quit calling people idiots. I'm not asking you to you know, count to 10 before you let your anger have its way. I, I'm just saying it's not an oops. It's a sin. And and it needs forgiveness. And, and if we've been hurt by or hurt someone in community, we need to answer the question, what is filling me up? If I'm not forgiving, what is filling me up that must be emptied out? But see, it even goes beyond that because we have to ask the question, what is filling us up? What, what is filling us up at Calvary in the church in America? What, what is filling Christian? What is filling our neighborhood up that needs to be emptied out? And that's where the practice of forgiveness, the emptying practice of forgiveness comes in. Forgiveness is the practice of emptying out the offense, emptying out the bitterness and the anger and the pain and the offense, emptying out from, from the hurts of community so that in community we can be filled up with the presence of Jesus. So where do we start practicing forgiveness? Well, let's start with Jesus' words in Matthew 5. 23 through 24, here's what he says. So if you're presenting, here's where he starts. So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, this was a big deal for them. Think biggest religious deal, you Easter service, <laughs> Christmas Eve service. You're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, Jesus says, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Doesn't even say how big. <laughs> You just suddenly remember that someone has something against you. So do this, Jesus says, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person and then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. See, here's where it starts. 
Practicing forgiveness requires a passion for relationships and reconciliation. And it's a passion that leads us to pursue reconciliation over religion. Pursuing reconciliation is far more important than a Sunday morning worship service. Isn't that what Jesus is saying? See, if reconciliation is a priority, then when you bring your gift to the altar and you remember your friend has something against you, stop the religious stuff, go and make things right, and do it now. And you think, wait a minute, you mean get up and leave church? What will people think? I don't know. Maybe they'll start thinking that reconciliation is more important than religious reputation. I mean, what if God... What if God put someone on your mind this morning? Someone with something against you, someone you're struggling to forgive, a broken relationship. I mean, if we carried this one out, and and why wouldn't we suggest that this is literally the words of Jesus? If we carried this one out, there'd be people leaving church every weekend, right? I mean, it would just be normal. You'd be singing, and then that face would flash in your mind, and it'd be like, oh, crud. You'd lean over to your spouse or your friend and say, I think I left my keys in the car. Think I left the lights on at home. But they'd know you're just going to make things right with someone. But that would be okay because as you walked out, you'd be walking out with five or six other people. Looks like we all left our lights on. See, we need that kind of passionate priority for reconciliation. Some are thinking, well, yeah, but. (laughs) I hate yeah, buts. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but, Dan, you you don't understand. What, What they did to me? I mean... No, I'm not, I'm not going. I mean, if they come to me, maybe then I might forgive, try to reconcile, but it's not my place to go to them. It's really interesting. In Matthew chapter 5, this passage that we're looking at now, Jesus says, if you know that you've hurt or offended someone, go to them. If you know that you hurt someone else, then go to them. That makes sense to us. But then later in Matthew 18, he says, if your friend has offended you, <laughs> you go to them. See, it really doesn't matter if you're the one who has done the offending or the one who's been offended. If you're passionate about reconciliation, the principle is, if you know, you go. If you know, you go. Do you know? Then go. If you know, you go. And when you go, here's the second part. Value reconciliation over being right. Have you noticed that? Maybe it's just me, but I found that when I have conflict with another person, I I can either focus on being reconciled or being right, but not both. And if my priority is figuring out who's right, I'll likely miss an opportunity to be reconciled. See, Jesus said in verses 25 and 26, when you are on your way to court with your adversary, your adversary is the person who's hurt you or you've hurt them, that's where the offense is. When you're on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly, Jesus says. Settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you'll be thrown into prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. What, what do you go to court for? Well, you go to court to figure out who's right, right? How many relationships ever get reconciled in court? Not many. And I'll tell you, this was a hard one for me to learn. When Lynn and I would have conflict, we've had a little bit of conflict in our lives. I, and I, I was certain. I was certain that the most important thing to do was to help her figure out that I was right. Because if we both understood that I was right, there'd be no conflict, <laughs> Some of you are getting elbowed by the person sitting next to you right now. In fact, sometimes, I I know you you won't believe this about me, sometimes I'd find myself praying, God, would you just open up her eyes so that she can see that she's wrong? I'll never forget being at, I think it was a Promise Keepers conference, and I was listening to Pastor Joe Garlington, and, and he spoke these words, and I was like, God was speaking right to me. He said, you know what? God is more concerned about you being reconciled than he is about you being right. Do you understand? We have an accuser. And it's not just the person we hurt. In fact, Satan's job title is accuser of the church. And to be honest, his accusations are pretty much spot on. When he stands before the judge, who also, if you're a Christ follower, who also happens to be our father, that's a good thing. And he's telling father what we're doing. He's usually not lying to God because God knows everything. In fact, Satan usually doesn't have to lie to bring an accusation against us. We have an accuser. But man, forgiveness is the key. Forgiveness is your key. 
Forgiveness is the key because forgiveness makes space for the presence of God in us. Forgiveness empties the bitterness and the pain and the sin. You know what? Ultimately, we forgive for us because when we forgive, we let ourselves out of the prison we've created for us that our our accuser has put us in. And when forgiveness flows, we create a space in us for Jesus. And that's why. And we have to forgive others as Jesus forgave us. And just let that soak in for the next few minutes as we make our way to communion. We forgive others as Jesus forgave us. Now, I I discovered Helen Roosevelt 30 plus years ago. I was listening to a talk that she gave to a bunch of college students at a missions conference. And over the years, I've I've studied her life because she was part of this amazing revival in what was then known as as the Congo. She was a a missionary there from 1953 to 1973. And... And there were some difficult times in the midst of those couple of decades, but it was also a time when God moved in this amazingly wondrous way. And, and Helen was part of both the wondrous and the difficult. When she would come back to the States on furlough, she, she loved sharing her stories with anybody who would listen, but especially with the next generation. And one night she was speaking to a small group of guys at a Christian university, all from the same residence hall. And, and they, they didn't know her. They didn't know her story. And, and they came less than excited, you know, just kind of, who is this woman? They're draped over couches and slumped on the floor. And they just kind of viewed her with skepticism. And, and if you ever saw her, I, I've watched her speak a, a bunch of times. She just... She had these thick glasses and a simple cotton dress and gray hair pulled back a bit too tight into a bun. And two minutes into her story, Helen sensed the the lack of interest and she just stopped. She said, you know what, you guys, I I don't want to bore you with the details of my life. It's late. Why don't we just take another 10 minutes and I'll answer some questions. I'd rather talk about things that interest you. And And a hand quickly shot up and, yeah, I got a question, one of the guys said. You know, there's missionaries, he said, missionaries coming through here all the time and they're always talking about paying the price and and suffering for Jesus. What did you ever suffer for Jesus? And without even a trace of bitterness, Dr. Roosevelt quietly said, well, during the Simba uprising in the Congo, I was raped twice. The room, of course, grew deathly quiet. She said, government soldiers came to my bungalow, they ransacked it, and then they grabbed me. I was savagely beaten. I lost my back teeth through a soldier's boot to my my face. They they broke my glasses so I couldn't even see to protect myself from the coming blows and and then two officers took me to my bedroom and raped me. And and then after they raped me they dragged me out and they tied me to a tree and and they all stood around laughing. I, I was beaten and humiliated and violated and then someone discovered my only existing handwritten manuscript of a book I'd been working on for a decade about the move of God in the Congo. They brought it out, put it on the ground in front of me, and they burned it. And as Helen watched the book go up and smoke through clenched teeth, she said to herself, is it worth it? 11 years of my life poured out in selfless service, and now this? You know, when I first heard that story, I could barely take it. And and as it kind of saturated my soul, I just thought, oh my God, how do you forgive that? I mean, how how would I ever be able to empty the pain and the bitterness and the anger and, and even a sense of betrayal by God? I mean, how do you empty your soul of all that? Is it worth it? The minute she asked that question, She said, God's spirit just seemed to settle over that whole terrible scene and he began to speak to me. Helen, my daughter, you're asking the wrong question. The question is not, is it worth it? The question is, am I worthy? Am I the Lord Jesus who gave his life for you, worthy for you to make this kind of sacrifice for me? She said, God broke my heart. She looked up and whispered, oh, Lord Jesus, yes, it's worth it for you are worthy. And then she said this, that the Spirit of God seemed to whisper, can you thank me? She said, I was ready to almost shout, no, this has gone too far. When I realized that the Lord was saying, can you thank me for trusting you with this situation? She said, it it was as though he said, yes, I could have taken you out, Helen. But I have a purpose. You, You cannot understand it now, but are you willing to be part of my purpose? Yes, God, she whispered. 
If you have a purpose in all of this, thank you for trusting me to be part of it. Immediately, she said, I was flooded by the peace of the Spirit of God. A young man in the group asked her, but did you ever struggle to forgive those men? She said, there was, there was no bitterness or even anger left in me. She said, I, I, was, I was just overwhelmed by the sense that God was graciously using me in his purpose. Overwhelmed by the sense of the presence of God. All he asked of me was the loan of my body. The consequences were his. She said, a year later, I had the opportunity to go to prison and meet the man who had humiliated me. And I had to face the fact that I did carry some resentment and I wasn't sure that I had forgiven him, but God led me to accept the forgiveness that only God can give and I was filled with peace again. Listen, the, the forgiveness of Christ, the, the extravagant grace of God is so gloriously amazing that it's hard to believe and sometimes it's not just hard to believe, it's hard to accept. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. It says, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer, no longer counting people's sins against them. And, and he gave us this wonderful message of, of reconciliation. We speak for Christ, Paul writes. When we plead, come back to God. Come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. God's not keeping track. That, that's what Paul says. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Who was God reconciling to himself? The whole world. <laughs> against whom is God not counting their sins? The whole world. That, that's everyone, right? Do, do you understand God doesn't hold grudges? When you say yes to God, God's there, same offer. I know some of us, <laughs> we think we're basically pretty good people. We're oopsters. We just need a little help from Jesus. No huge debt of sin. God's blessed to have me on his team. And, and listen, it will take an act of God for you to see the sin that God sees. But for just a moment, let me talk to those of you on the other side. I don't need to convince you. You feel like your sin is so great, not too small. You're sure that God's turned his back on you, always disappointed in you, always annoyed. He'll never forgive you. He's keeping a record of your every failure, every disappointment, every mess, every tiny act of rebellion. And it's a long list. You know it's a long list. But listen to me. I don't care how long the list is. God is for you. The heart of your father is moved by your condition. And he stands ready to release and forgive you. The debt has been paid. Your biggest sin, your greatest failure, your deepest regrets, past, present, and even future. They've been covered by the extravagance of God's grace. He's paid your unpayable debt. But for the gift to be received, you have to acknowledge that you need it. That's where it starts. I can only forgive others as Jesus forgives me. And as Jesus forgives me, then I'm able to forgive others as Jesus has forgiven me after my soul has saturated in his gracious forgiveness. You understand our capacity to receive grace from God is shaped by our willingness to forgive others. This is a hard truth, but Jesus says it more than once. If we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. Here's the deal, we, we need grace, every one of us. We need grace more than we care to admit. And God offers us amazing grace. But when we try to live our lives without needing his grace, we usually live our lives without giving grace. And that's actually our purpose. This ministry of reconciliation that God has given to us is a ministry of forgiveness and grace. We're meant to be conduits, pipelines, rivers of, of forgiveness and grace flowing out to a world in, in need of amazing grace. And when we give grace, when we give grace, we make space for God. And people who are hungry for God, they find God. And when they find God, more grace flows. In an Easter sermon, Lee Eckloff told a story about Laura and Greg. 
He said about 23 years ago, they called him and wanted to get married. He, he tried to give them the brush off. They weren't Christians. They just wanted a church wedding. And he was pretty gruff. Eckloff says, I, I told them that getting married in a church didn't win them any more favors with God than getting married under the blue light at Kmart. If they didn't have God in their lives, a church wedding wouldn't do much good. She said, well, if you won't marry us, would you at least talk to us some more about this God stuff? And he was kind of embarrassed by his attitude, so he grudgingly agreed. Ekloff says that in that very first visit, after they got acquainted, he, he explained the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and when, they to, when he told them how our sin has filled us up and killed us inside, they said they understood that. And when he told them that Jesus died to put our sins to death and rose from the dead to give us new life, they said they understood that. He says, when I asked them if they would like to put their faith in Jesus Christ, they could hardly wait. They each prayed, confessing their sin and asking Jesus to forgive them. 23 years later, he was talking to Lauren. He asked her about that day. She said, you know, what, what I remember is that as soon as I prayed, I wanted to ask you if I could get up on your desk and dance. Riding home behind Greg on his motorcycle, she yelled, oh, I feel so good. Greg had to tell her to quit squeezing him so hard she was cutting off his, his circulation. She says, I, I remember thinking, I feel like I just took the best shower of my life. <laughs> That's the kind of grace I'm talking about. The kind of grace that makes you feel like you just took the best shower of your life and makes you want to dance on the desk. You know, we live in a cancel culture. And the great danger of a cancel culture is that forgiveness becomes optional. But when forgiveness is forgotten, we're all just one big reveal away from being canceled. See, what we need more than anything is we need a movement of forgiveness, a wave of grace to sweep through our country and our church and our neighborhoods and, and our families. And that's what I'm praying for. And that's what I'm celebrating as we take communion today and are reminded of the way in which, the extent to which Jesus has forgiven us. We pray for you. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. And I pray that if there's anybody who has never experienced that, that, that today, this moment would be the moment when they just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died for me on the cross and you rose again. Would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me from my sin? Would you pour out your grace upon me? God, I pray that if, if anybody needs to make that decision, that that would happen. And God, for those of us who have made that decision, if there's people we haven't forgiven, if there's people that we have offended and we need to ask their forgiveness, God, would you make that a priority in our lives so that we would forgive just as, to the same extent, in the same way that Jesus has forgiven us. Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for what communion signifies. It's in your name that we pray, amen.